Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Sandy Grande, and she's an associate professor and chair of the education department at Connecticut College. Her research and teaching are profoundly inter and cross disciplinary, interfacing critical indig indigenous theory with the concerns of education. Her book, Red Pedagogy Native American Social and Political Thought, is currently being published in a 10th anniversary edition. And, and I want to talk for a moment. So, as a as a grad student, the work of Ivana Lincoln greatly and profoundly influenced my thinking about research and methodology. And um, as a newly minted PhD, when I got hired to come here, a dear friend of mine, uh, Sylvia Smith, said, Mark, you're, you're going to Treaty 4. I said, so what? I'm from Ottawa. We didn't talk about treaties ever. I said, you're going to Treaty 4. Here's a book. She gave me about pedagogy and said, you should read this book you're going to Treaty 4. And um, so I did read the book, and as a junior faculty member, it profoundly influenced my thinking and set me up to learn from this place that I'm coming to, because it was an issue that I ought to have known about, but I didn't, and it never came up in my studies. And it never came up in my K-12 studies, it never came up in my graduate school work. It was absent, silenced, erased. Um, but anybody who does come here and doesn't take up the issue of indigenous justice is doing something wrong. And so I, I want to personally thank Sandy because she was a teacher in her book to me. But also in organizing this conference, she continues to be a teacher and continue to be one. I had lots of exchanges with Sandy uh, throughout the year and with each email she taught me something. And so it's a, it's a real honor to have her come and speak. And can't wait to sit in the front row like an eager pupil. So thank you, Sandy. Uh, thank you, Mark. Wow, no pressure. Um, <laughs> uh, but that lovely introduction really uh, speaks to the main, I guess, sensibility I've gained since I've been here and prior, and, and that's of generosity. Um, from, and just really, taking in all the generosity I've had of spirit since I've come here. Um, and, the good, and that's much a testament to, to Mark, I think to your work and the way you organized it and the way you structured and have talked to us, you've fed us uh, in so many ways and I'm very grateful to that. I'm grateful to the Life Speaker Star Blanket for welcoming, welcoming us in a blessing way and reminding us that we are indeed guests on this land. And I'm grateful for the words and ideas of all the previous speakers. I've really learned so much. Um, I'm even grateful, so I apologize for not being here earlier this morning. I feel like I haven't wanted to miss five minutes of the conference, but I'm um, battling a bit of a stomach flu. But uh, I think actually even grateful for that. Nothing like, this is going to sound really <laughs> crass, but uh, nothing like just before I talk being reminded of just how full of shit you actually are. <laughs> so, makes it all like very visceral, I think. To... So coming from that very humble place. Um, are my, is that set up? Are the... So the title of my presentation is a gesture to Hull's edited text, All the Women Are White, All the Blacks Are Men, But Some of Us Are Brave. Written in 1982, the collective of black women scholars and activists established the field of black women's studies, writing back and against the sexism and racism they experienced in black studies and women's studies respectively. Though written over 30 years ago, their efforts to establish an intellectual home within the academy remains ongoing. A durability, I think, provides important insights for indigenous <coughs> scholars working to define spaces for native studies within the 21st century academy. While indigenous peoples are racialized, race is not the primary analytic of native subjectivity, nor is racism the main structure of domination. <coughs> that would be settler colonialism. Similarly, while indigeneity is taken up within ethnic and American studies, indigenous peoples as sovereign nations are more akin to nation states than ethnic groups. Yet they also refuse the nationalist discourses and do not consider themselves to be part of America as a political community. Furthermore, the intellectual and political projects of communities of color and other marginalized groups are organized around the topos of inclusion, um, such as equal rights, citizenship, etc., 
which is problematic for Native peoples who have resisted incorporation, asserting instead a prior and enduring sovereignty. Finally, while, while the decidedly anti-statist, anti-capitalist, <clears throat> the whiteness and maleness within Marxist, anarchist, and other radical enclaves also makes for an uneasy fit, despite some shared commitments. The resulting tensions and complex intersections not only illuminate the specificity of indigenous subjectivity, but also the contours of a distinctive political project, one that compels careful thinking around what it means to build collective solidarities. That being said, I'm interested in exploring the problematic that Hull and her colleagues set out to address in the name of Black Women's Studies for Native Studies, thinking through its place within the academy. Some of the questions circulating in the background of this discussion are, can you maybe flip to the next? So some of these questions um, were prepared for this talk, but also in response to some of the tensions I think that have been circulating in the room, and it sounds like those are also getting played out, animated by the last presentation. So perhaps when there's time we can return to some of these questions, but uh, Here's how I'm understanding it. In what ways does the, the particular history of indigenous dispossession, mediated through a settler logic of elimination, differently position native scholars vis-a-vis -vis the academy and other marginalized groups? What, th what are the incommensurabilities between sovereignty and social justice projects, between those defined by relations of erasure and dispossession, and those by exclusion and oppression? And what kinds of solidarities and collectivities can be developed among groups with a shared commitment to working beyond the imperatives of capital. At its core, this analysis turns upon a theorization of the academy as an arm of the settler state, a space where not only capitalist relations and modes of production are reconstituted, but also settler logics. To be clear, this is distinct from other critiques of the academy as fundamentally neoliberal, Eurocentric, or patriarchal. While the structures of settler colonialism may be made more visible by neoliberalism and other technologies of domination, it is distinct set of relations, one predicated on the theft of indigenous land and the remove to replace logics that enabled that theft. I mark this distinction as a way of underscoring the difference between decolonizing projects activated by claims to indigenous sovereignty and resurgence and others aimed toward a liberal horizon of access and equity. Uh, this reminds me of a question that was uh, brought up, I think, yesterday with regard to Joel's uh, presentation um, where there was talk of an equitable redistribution of resources, and I think a question to ask um, toward that aim is what what is the equitable distribution of stolen resources look like? Like, what does that look like? I'm particularly interested in reflecting upon the limitations as well as the political function of what Pavanelli terms the liberal diaspora and its attended discourses of reconciliation and recognition. Projects promoted since the 1980s as a means of managing the legacies of political violences for victims and perpetrators living together in the same society. I think I'm gonna skip forward a little bit. I just kind of carry through the histories a bit of those discourses of reconciliation recognition in their relationship to liberal theories of governmentality. And um, basically in this section coming forward, uh, I look at the analyses of the politics and recognitions coming from critical indigenous scholars such as um, Glenn Cuthard and Audra Simpson and Robert Nichols, uh, and then mapping those analyses onto the history of higher education. So historically, the university functioned as the institutional nexus for the capitalist Historically, the university functioned as the institutional nexus for the capitalist and religious missions of the settler state, mirroring its history of dispossession, enslavement, exclusion, forced assimilation, and integration. As noted by Craig Wilder, author of Ebony and Ivy, the academy was a beneficiary and defender of the same social and economic forces that transformed West and Central Africa through the slave trade and devastated indigenous nations in the Americas. Here's a quote, American colleges were not innocent or passive beneficiaries of conquest and colonial slavery. The European invasion of the Americas and the modern slave trade pulled peoples through the Atlantic world into each other's lives, and colleges were among the colonial institutions that braided their histories and rendered their fates dependent and antagonistic. The academy never stood apart from American slavery, and I add here, native dispossession. In fact, it stood beside church and state as the third pillar of a civilization built upon bondage. 
It wasn't until the mid 20th century that the underlying justification for exclusion and unvarnished forms of assimilation were broadly questioned as incompatible with contemporary norms of liber liberal democracy, compelling strategies of reconciliation and recognition. More specifically, the post-civil rights university became the institutional structure through which reconciliatory discourses and strategies were imagined and demands for recognition were deployed. Within the context of the liberal academy, such discourses garner wide appeal in that they provide a means for neatly bracketing what are fundamentally complex and ongoing sets of relations, marking a definitive endpoint to a history of wrongdoing and from moving beyond that history. Consider, for example, the recent wave of colleges and universities in the United States that had issued public apologies for their involvement in the slave trade. The University of Alabama, Virginia, Emory University, among others, have all issued apologies. The University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill erected a memorial. Washington and Lee recently removed all of its Confederate flags, and the College of William and Mary has launched an investigation into a history of its complicity. None, however, have offered reparations. None, to my knowledge, have acknowledged that they are on stolen land. Brown University, which has arguably launched the most comprehensive project, including a commission three-year study, an acknowledgement, a memorial, and an endowment for Providence City Schools, reports that only 7.3% of its student body and 4% of its faculty are African American. Such statistics suggest that one-off performative acts, such as apologies and remembrances, have the potential to include the need as well as forestall demands for structural change. Beyond their failure to transform material conditions, conciliatory discourses have come to insidiously frame the demands for recognition issued by subaltern peoples themselves. And I find this to be more troubling. On some level, this is to be expected as stories of exclusion and appropriation trade in the manufacturing of desire for inclusion and restoration, what Ahmed refers to as the affective economy. That is, the seductions of the settler state are played out libidinally through the investment in its mirages of safety and inclusion, which proceed through what Agathangelo calls the imperial projects of promise and non-promise. That is, when certain classes of subjects are offered a tenuous invitation into the folds of empire, there are always the bodies of non-subjects that serve as the raw material for this process. The false promise of a democratic future is waged upon a series of non-promises to those upon whom the whole production is staged. Consider, for example, one of the most recent and widely celebrated texts to narrate the struggles of women of color in the academy entitled Presumed Incompetent, the Intersections of Race and Class for Women in Academia. The 30 personal narratives capture the visceral embodied nature of their struggle, with the text providing a space for women to, quote, name their wounds in order to heal them. While the authors gestured toward transformation, the kind of change ultimately demanded is that which will provide future generations more fulfilling, respectful, more fulfilling, respectful, and dignified experiences. I don't mean to suggest that these are not important aims. Everyone deserves dignified experiences at work. The problem is, is the project seems to end there. Indeed, of the over 60 recommendations made, none call into question the material conditions or colonialist relations that situate women in asymmetric relations of power. In other words, the central anxiety does not lie with the systems of domination that gave rise to the university, but rather with women's inability to fully participate in it, a struggle that is unfortunately named as decolonization in the following passage. Quote, the essays in Presumed Incompetent point toward the third world feminist recognition that the business of knowledge production, like the production of teas, spices, and bananas, has an imperialist history that it has never shaken. Inventing the post-colonial university is the task of the 21st century. We can only hope that this task of decolonizing American academia is completed before the tenure track itself disappears. Sorry, I realized. So that's one of the, the memorials at Brown. And this is the text I'm talking about. Um, we can only hope that this task of decolonizing American academia is completed before the tenure track itself disappears. Otherwise, scholars in the next century may confront another ironic example of women finally rising in a profession just as it loses its prestige and social value. Ultimately, the women's quest for equality as mobilized through a politics of recognition belies their own stated aims. That is, while the effects of recognition that is, belonging, validation, tenure, promotion, may fetter the damage of non-recognition or misrecognition. Their pursuit of the traditional rewards of what Wolf calls terms the inducements of the settler state replicates capitalist relations of production as well as colonialist relations of power, whereby the dominant agent 
that is the settler state or the institution, retains the authority to recognize the subaltern. Wolf writes, from the treaty area onwards, indigenous peoples have been subjected to a recurrent cycle of inducements, that is allotments, citizenship, travel, enrollment, etc., providing native peoples choices that present domination as empowerment, thereby soliciting native peoples consent to their own dispossession. Coulthard similarly warns against the effects of inducements, particularly as they tender economic gains for individuals. He argues that when recognition is granted through mainstream forms of economic development, it inheres the potential for creating a new aboriginal elite whose thirst for profit comes to outweigh their ancestral obligations. In this instance, the thirst for academic recognition drives a culture of competition and self-promotion, one that mistakes the formation of an intellectual elite of color for radical social change. For those in engaged in efforts to dismantle a neoliberal university, attention to its affective economies is imperative. If we do not work to articulate the ways in which we become libidinally invested in the status quo, we run the risk of reproducing the same relations of exploitation we aim to dismantle. Two minutes? 20, 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, so this section is the, about the, uh, developing the possibility of academic refusal, again drawing upon the work in critical indigenous studies, primarily um, lots of people. I think I'm going to skip through that. Um, I'll give maybe two quick examples. Within the field of indigenous research, Audra Simpson theorizes refusal at the level of method and representation, exposing the colonial underpinnings of the academic demand to know as a settler logic. She posits ethnographic refusal as a stance or space for indigenous subjects to limit access to what is knowable, to being known. Understood as expressions of sovereignty, acts of refusal are threatening to the settler state, carrying dire, if not deadly, consequences for indigenous subjects. Indeed, native peoples worldwide continue to be disappeared or murdered at disproportionate rates, as their very bodies and beings are regarded as refusals. While sanctions in the academy are not about life and death, typically, refusal to comply with the normative published parish tenure promotion disciplinary strategies can and do lead to increased marginalization, exploitation, and job loss. And in a system where indigenous scholars comprise less than 1% of the profession, such consequences not only bear hardships for individuals, but more importantly, for whole communities. And I, and I give that statistic very tenuously about the 1%, because when we just think of that, decontextualize that we're just such a percent of the academy, um, I think there's a way to read that as a failure and a way to read that as a refusal. Um, okay. That being said, inducements are bad. We should not uh, seek them. OK, academic survivance is the <laughs> section here. Um, and where I sort of return to the question of what kinds of solidarities and, and collectivities can we build. Um, despite the ubiquitous and off overly, often overly facile calls for solidarity, building effective coalitions is deeply challenging, particularly when working with among indigenous peoples and settlers of color or white radical scholars for whom the assertions of indigenous sovereignty and decolonization force an uncomfortable reframing of anti-racist, abolitionist, and social justice agendas. To this end, I believe the question is not if a praxis of decolonization is pertinent to other radical struggles, but rather how and why it is. Ultimately, it is incumbent upon all of us who claim a commitment to disrupting the individualized, consumptive, and privatized logics to do the hard work of building solidarities and forming collectivities. So what might this look like? I'm just going to sketch out a few things here, uh, three points, and then I hope we can have some conversation. First and foremost, I think we need to commit to a disruption of complicity. To stage a collective refusal of the promised project of settler colonialism, this requires that we engage in a radical and ongoing re reflexivity about who we are and how we situate ourselves in the world. This includes, but is not limited to, refusal of the cycle of inducements to the seduction of endless self-promotion and branding, the Twitter feeds, the personal web pages, the incessant Facebook updates about our latest accomplishments, publications, grants, rewards, etc. Just make it stop. Second, we must commit to accountability, not accounting as noted by Michelle Fine, but an accountability that is primarily about being answerable to those communities we claim as our own and those we claim to serve. We can also be answerable to each other and our work. As previously noted, one of the things lost to the publisher parish quantity over quality regime is the loss of good critique. In the Manichaean audit culture, we have come to confuse support with sycophantic praise. 
Accountability to the collective requires a commitment to engage, extend, trouble, speak back to, and intensify each other's works and deeds. Third, we need to commit to responsibility, which implies reciprocity, or the development of social relations not contingent upon self-aggrandizement or exploitation, but rather mutuality. Inherent to the development of such relations is a commitment to slowness, as Linda Smith referenced, the arc of generational resurgence and transformation. One of the many ways that the academy refracts colonial logics is through the overvaluing of fast, new, young, and individualist, and undervaluing of slow, elder, and collective. And in such a system, relations and paradigms of connection, mutuality, and collectivity are inevitably undermined. Also, I think among other things, this distinction marks the edges of a binary that colonial logic seeks to eliminate. The difference between subjectivities produced in and through relationship to land, which takes time, and those produced under and through the significations of property. Toward this end, I've been thinking a lot lately about the formation of a new scholarly collective, one that writes and researches under a nom de guerre. If furthering indigenous resition, resurgence and not individual recognition is indeed what we hold paramount, then perhaps one of the most radical refusals we can authorize is to work together as one. The act to enact a kind of Zapatismo scholarship, a balaclava politics of the concealment, where the work of the collectivity transcends the one voice, body, and life. Together we could write in refusal of essentialist and identitarian politics, of indig individualist indu inducements, and other affective economies of the settler, of settler desire. Let's do it. Let some of us be brave. Yeah. Uh, if you want, I can go back to the, if people, some of these questions. <laughs> Thank you. That, that was a wonderful talk. And I think that you pose the challenges, but also the possibilities of an emergent well of club uh, politics that is unfazed by the fact that it is using a nom de guerre, but insists on using its own language to name its sense of its project. I think that's a, that's, that's a wonderful example. In this province, the province of Saskatchewan, uh, we have had recently, uh, with the provincial government, uh, the declaration in the context of indigenous rights to resources that the honor of the crown and the duty to consult have both got lip service, but nothing beyond that in terms of the uh, agenda of the extractive economy. Now, uh, the premier of the province has said the resources of Saskatchewan belong to everybody in Saskatchewan. So there's a retreat into what seems like a liberal universalism, where meritocracy or hard work or something else will mean that everybody gets what they deserve. In the academy, uh, I think a lot of us have the capacity to analyze and deconstruct and refuse that particular argument as an escape from the need for redistribution. Because whenever you move beyond, in Canada, reconciliation to redistribution, the conversation stops and people leave the table. Do you have any strategies uh, that you have drawn on to at least make a dent in that particular carapace behind which people claim to be just and universalistic while they are reinscribing the racist colonial practices of the past? Yeah, I wish I did. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, to me, that's the, I was, what I'm trying to mark is kind of the insidious nature of a liberal politics, which I think is way worse than, um, in my estimation, because it is so invisible and, and gets publicly marked as being progressive and all these other things. But just to be clear, um, I think the platform, you know, the I Don't Know More has a great platform. When it, I don't know if he's, it's like land, sovereignty, whatever the like six things are. I think when you have a defined platform, you can move from there then to kind of, um, you know, a balaclava. Like everybody's working together toward that, pro toward that platform. Um, so I don't think it's a, a, just a general redistribution that everybody gets everything. Um, so I just wanted to be clear about that in case it was confusing.
<coughs> Other questions? Sandy, can I speak from here? Yeah, I can. Um, have you seen um, exemplars of kinds of solidarities and collectivities that do not play the game that you, you rightly are critiquing? Well, there's a, a history, and what was the collective that com is the combo? There's a black women's writers collective that you might know, the combo, yeah. Hatchi River Collective. There's actually a, a group of geographers that are writing as a collective now, just a geographer's collective um, critiquing the neoliberal university. Um, I think there's probably way more than, than I'm remembering at the moment, but there's a long history of collectives and then, um, you know, the notion of the balaclava politics is, you know, really rooted in the Zapatismo politics where there was a Marcos, but there wasn't a Marcos, right? So a real, which is different to me than the kind of liberal leaderless movement, um, which I have issues with too, um, because there's definitely leadership, there's definitely a platform, there's definitely voices that are there, they're just not being named. Can I follow up with something? Yeah. So in, in your opinion, do you think we need a radical <coughs> rethinking of the very idea of the university that may involve the creation of a new kind of university as opposed to trying to work. Absolutely. There's actually a really great article. I can't think of the name of it at the moment, but it's in Decolonizing. It's in Eric Risky's um, Decolonizing Education and Society, and it's about <coughs> the need for hospicing the university. Um, which I just think is a fabulous concept in that it's um, a recognition that it's dying, right? <laughs> but that rather than sort of kill it off and just like make this demand of, you know, that it, there's a little bit more generosity of saying it served a purpose at a particular time and toward particular aims, um, but it's, it's going, it's this close. And so can we think now of a way to kind of, and as somebody who hospiced my mom really recently, I, it speaks to me, I think, to do it in a way that honors, I mean, there's, you know, history of slavery. I mean, there's some that doesn't need, but we all have complicated lives, I guess, right? So, but to just like put it to rest, um, to me, that's a model that speaks more clearly and resonates for me more than kind of this notion that you know, and Eve talked about it early, to, of indigenizing. Um, but it's a real question for me, like it's not something that I feel firm or real settled on, you know, when I walk by and I see like rooms in a university for smudging that are here, like it gives me pause. I don't know, like is that a victory or is that something else? And I, you know, I, I honestly don't know. They, they are all questions for me. Peter? Oh. I just wanted to know, like, instead of um, putting it to rest, because I think it would be really a long process to manage to do that, I'm wondering if we can use the transformative forces that have been evoked, uh, for example, by um, Dr. Gaffield, in terms of like the digital age and transforming the pedagogy, the, the learner's based environment. Like, what are some of these forces that might help us in in tackling that question, those questions, and transforming. Yeah, I, mean, <clears throat> I think the authors, and I don't know if somebody might be able to look it up, but. Um, yeah, I'm tweeting it, but it's uh, the piece by uh, Vanessa de Oliveria and yeah, Riotti, that's it. that one, yeah. right? So it's mapping interpretation of decolonization in the context of higher ed. Yeah. I think the sensibility is really that we might be doing more damage by like, we can do this, we can add, you know, we can save it this way. And that's sort of the notion of hospicing too. Like, you can keep doing stuff, but ultimately you're just prolonging a, like a, a situation that's really not good for anybody. Like just, let's put it away. Hey, uh, Sandy, there's, there's the uh, EduFactory Collective. Nice. And you can download their it's a manifesto that's it's, I mean, it's two or three hundred pages long. You can download it free on the internet. And um, it's a collection of, of mostly cultural studies <coughs> folks uh, writing about rethinking the entire university. 
which is, it's a fabulous uh, document actually. And Edu Factory, <coughs> E-D-U Factory. There's also a great article by Mike Neary, N-E-A-R-Y, in um, Critical Education, Journal for Critical Education Policy Studies, that gives you the whole history of the Knowledge Liberation Front, uh, things that were happening in Paris, things that are happening now, gr international groups that are banding together to rethink the very nature of the university. And Mike Neary's article um, gives kind of summarizes that history, the history of that struggle, and uh, shares some of the things that he's doing in, um, in his own work. I think it's the University of Lincoln in England. It's worthwhile looking on. Yeah, thanks so much. Appreciate it. I just want to ask, and I ask this really humbly and unknowingly, um, but I don't know, I wonder if the concept of healing, which seems to be so important and so integral, like maybe the university needs some healing rather than just letting it die off. I, I, I'm so committed to the university, but I come from a different, so I don't know. I, do you have a response to that, or does anybody have a response to the notion of healing? Yeah. Possibly, but I mean, again, there's a point at which, you know, and it, it's visceral for me because coming off for just, just a, about a year ago, hospicing my mom, and I think you just get a point where it's like, yeah, it's, there's no healing, but it's very generous time. It's, it's not like uh, aggressive, I guess. It's, it's like, it's, it's had a long life. <laughs> Maybe it's time for it to go. I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. The follow-up is not replace it with what, but, but all the things that it can do and, like, its potential. Where does that go? Or I mean, I think in alternative spaces, of which there are many, I think, already, they just they just not, aren't being recognized, I think, or kind of uh, we're, we spend so much energy trying to fix, you know, that I think we're not, we, the, one of the questions I think they raise is, if we let go of that energy, where can we put our collective wisdom and energies toward? and creative conversations that I've been part of and, and one of uh, around like what kinds of universities are possible and my frequent colleague Wayne Yang has a new paper that's coming out called a third a third university is possible um, and uh, I know that uh, Fred Moten and Stefano Harney have that great publication on the under commons. And I, I think that there's so many wonderful ways that people are thinking about what the university has been and what it can be. And, and, and that language that we get from that piece around hospicing, I agree, is so important. And, and I think, uh, <clears throat> I just, I think I'm so appreciative, Sandy, that you are uh, linking what uh, uh, just providing additional argument for why uh, why that might be the turn that we are willing to bravely face <coughs> now. Uh, so I just wanted to affirm that as being some, like something that <coughs> lots of people in lots of different ways are working on, and even even though it seems like you're giving up so much. Like Dr. Linda said the other day, <coughs> let's not romanticize what the pre-neoliberal <laughs> university has been and, and what the university, what, how the university has been in service <coughs> of settler colonialism. Mm -hmm. So uh, whatever those metaphors about rearranging the chairs on the sinking <coughs> Titanic or something like that <laughs> seem appropriate. Um, and to, to make, of course, it's on the last day of the conference that that's where our imaginations are even capable of taking us. But I think that that's so important, and I'm down for more conversation around that. 
Thanks, Ian. Yeah, and I think it's particularly resonant for, so maybe indigenous peoples definitely need to hospice. I don't know about everybody else, but um, I think we have, you know, lots of alternative spaces, lots of people thinking about it. Um, but to me, the way it gets, you know, I think part of why I don't think about healing is because I don't know how to get out of that, like, constant politics of recognition, right, of, like, uh, and it's, we're all complicit, you know, it's just like, um, but what, what would it mean to write and not, like, the whole first author and, you know, I don't